Hello, my name is Megan Longoria, and today I'd like to talk to you about inclusive presentation design. I am a consultant with Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting, as well as a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I have been interested in inclusive information design for several years now, and I like to apply that in Power BI, but I've turned my focus to how we can help others get information out of our presentations and make sure they don't feel excluded. So I do have a copy of these slides and handouts on my website at datasavvy.me on the presentations page if you are interested. If you are like me, you have lots of knowledge to share and you are excited to give presentations either online or one day hopefully in person. There are certain ways that we can design our slides, our visual presentation layer, as well as the way that we speak and the way that recorded presentations are delivered. So I'm going to use the term inclusive design here. Uh, it may not have a distinct meaning to you. So first I would like to address what inclusive design can mean. Microsoft has a, a very good inclusive design website that includes a few principles to help us design more inclusively. So when we design for inclusivity, it opens up our products and services to more people. And it also reflects how people really are. Lots of us um, grow, all humans grow and adapt to the world around them. And we want our designs to reflect that. So first we need to recognize exclusion. Everyone has abilities and limits to those abilities. When we design for people with permanent disabilities, it usually results in designs that benefit people universally. So constraints can be a beautiful thing. Another principle is to learn from diversity. So human beings are the real experts in adapting to diversity and inclusive design puts people in the center from the start of the process. And it takes in fresh, diverse perspectives to help us gain insight into how to design for people. Let's see if you have experienced any of these situations. You're at a conference or you're watching a webcast and someone says, oh, I know this is too small to read, but here's what it says. How about someone who reads directly off the slides all the time? Now, this can happen for a lot of reasons, especially new speakers who may get nervous and they want to use their slides as a crutch to make sure they stay on point and don't lose sight of what they're trying to communicate. And that can be a good desire to communicate that information, but the way that you communicate it can greatly affect how much information people receive and retain. So the first thing we want to pay attention to is where is your focus? When you start speaking, uh, many of us focus on what we want to say. What do I want to say in my presentation? And then as you become a more mature speaker, you may move into what do I want my audience to learn? And you start with that and work backwards to what you want to say. So many of us have experienced the fact that the way that the presenter conveys the information affects our ability to learn. When we think about this from not just an inclusivity standpoint, but an accessibility standpoint, we have to acknowledge that nothing is accessible to everyone. There are so many uh, spectrums of ability to see, hear, think, remember, that it's very hard to have a truly universal design. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. So we want to make our presentations as inclusive as possible 
knowing that we'll likely never hit 100%, but you know, going from 20% to 80% could be a really good accomplishment. And we can continue to learn how to make more inclusive presentations and raise that number even more over time as we get more experience. So the first area I would like to address is presentation environment. Whether you are online or in person, you need to have a decent microphone. So if you are on a panel, everyone should have their own microphone when panels are in person. Even if you're doing it online and you have multiple people in a room, you need to make sure every person sounds clear on the microphone available. You also need to consider captions. Captions or subtitles, depending on if you want to include sound outside of spoken word. If you are presenting live, consider what your options are for captioning. If you can't have captioning, will you have a sign language interpreter? There are lots of programs that help us with real-time captions. For instance, if you use Teams in meetings, you can see the captions being written down in some meetings. You need to decide whether that is accurate enough or not. When you present in PowerPoint, PowerPoint has real-time captioning built in in the modern versions. Lots of people have found that to be very accurate for their terminology. Another thing to consider is lighting. Can we see the speaker? If you're going to have interpreters, can we see the interpreters? This applies more to in-person, but also online. So where I'm standing right now is just an office in my home. And the light changes during the day because I have a window. So before I start recording videos or joining meetings at night, I make sure I have enough light in the room to be seen. We can't always do this, but if possible, it's good to ask if anyone in your audience has any accessibility needs beforehand. I did a pre-con a couple years ago in Austin and somebody emailed in beforehand and said they were deaf and they needed an interpreter. And so we figured out how to get a sign language interpreter involved. And I made sure to spell out or define acronyms so that they could communicate that, that back to them. None of this is really overly burdensome, but it's things that need to be planned before you get in front of your audience. If you're going to do an in-person conference, you need to think about the location and whether that's accessible for speakers and attendees. I've seen situations where there were very tall stages without steps. You kind of had to climb on as a speaker and not everyone can do that. They may have knee trouble or balance issues. So we need to make sure we have an easy way for people to get up onto the stage or to the podium to be able to speak. And we also want to make sure attendees can find a seat easily. So can a wheelchair get down an aisle if somebody needs power for uh, portable oxygen or something else, just their, their laptop to be able to monitor things? Can we provide that so that they're comfortable and not distracted while we're talking? I've already talked about the stage being accessible. But we also want to make sure the way that we're displaying, if we have slides or demos, information to the audience is accessible as well. I've seen some situations where the screen that we're projecting onto um, is a little older and the projector is a little older. And so your slides may not show up as much. I've had situations where I'm presenting kind of in the center and I have two screens back behind me and there's no monitor for me to see what those screens look like. So I'm constantly having to turn my head to see what's going on 
for the visuals for the audience. That works for me, but it may not work for other people. So these are the types of questions we want to ask up front, especially if you're organizing a conference and finding a location. We also want to make sure for in-person conferences, you know, our lighting for speakers and interpreters is good so that people can see you clearly. And now let's talk about things that are specific to online conferences. First, you need a quiet place to present. It can be very hard during a pandemic, especially to find a quiet place if everybody in your household is home. 100% get that, but try to find a good quiet place as best you can so that your audio comes through clearly for your audience. Try to pick a background environment that isn't too busy. If you have to present while you're at work, uh, try to get out of a heavy traffic area. If you're presenting from home, if you're presenting from home, try to simplify your background at least to the point where it's not distracting. You can see my background has a lot of books and things I've picked up in my travels, and I think that's okay. We don't want distracting movement and extra sound. That's the most important part. I often present with a green screen or a gray solid background behind me to remove some of the extra um, color, but I also think it dehumanizes us a bit. We all know that I live in a house with an office and I own things and some of my personality comes through with this background. So that's up to you. We just wanna make sure that the background behind us isn't distracting. You definitely need to make sure for online conferences that you have a steady internet connection. Especially if, as we mentioned earlier, you're sending captions to an external web service that needs to stay strong so that the captions stay in sync with your voice and video. There's nothing more distracting and it happens. We can't always avoid it, but there's nothing more distracting than when a speaker loses connection and we all wait and we're not sure if they're gonna be able to come back and finish the presentation or not. Uh, there's no blame to be assigned, but if you can upfront, make sure that you know you are going to be in a place with a steady internet connection that can help a lot and reduce some of the risk. So now we're getting to my favorite part and that is presentation design. How do you design your slides and demos to be more inclusive, to be more accessible? The first thing I want to talk about is fonts. We want to minimize the number of different fonts that we use. So I'm going to give you guidelines and there can be good reasons to break them. But the way I think about it is go with this standard until you have a good reason to deviate. So generally in my presentations, I use about two different fonts and that's it. When you use more than that, it can be very distracting. People start wondering, why did you switch fonts? Um, is there some meaning behind it that they're supposed to have inferred? When we're choosing our fonts, Research right now says that sans serif is generally easier to read in the slide format. When you're reading newspapers, often serif fonts can be useful, but sans serif, meaning they don't have little glyphs on the end of the letters, are easier to read in this digital kind of summarized format where it's not just a paragraph full of text. We also want to look for fonts with distinct letter shapes. And I'll show you a demo of different fonts to help you see this. But many fonts will use the same shape for one uppercase I and lowercase L. There are some other letters that can be easily confused as well. So if I can avoid it, I will avoid fonts that have lots of similar 
shapes that don't have something to distinguish similar looking letters. This can help for people with dyslexia, people uh, who speak English as a second language and have a different alphabet. We also want to look for fonts with wider strokes. So it's not that the font itself needs to be wide, but that the lines that make up the font should be sufficiently wide. They're not entirely very skinny. That helps for people with different vision conditions, just low vision in general. When the lines and the letters are very small, you'll see people kind of squint to read. And that's what we want to try to avoid. Because if they're focused on the fact that they can't read what's on your slide, then they're not focused on the information you're trying to give them. So let's look at a few different fonts. Here's our Sans Serif, which is Source Sans Pro font, compared to a Serif font, which is Times New Roman. You'll notice the Serif font has the glyphs on the ends of the S. We tend to want to use sans serif. It's not a hard and fast rule where you can never use a serif font in a presentation. Uh, but as I said earlier, sans serif can often be easier to read. Let's look at plain versus decorative. It can be fun to use a decorative font, maybe on a title slide as just decoration. But we again, our goal is to make sure our audience is getting something out of our presentation. So we want to make sure that they can read everything that we present to them. So a plain font like Verdana may be much easier to read compared to a very decorative font where the shapes of the letters may be difficult to distinguish, especially if you're in person and sitting very far back in the audience. Here's the difference between the distinguishable letters. So if we look at Arial versus Callisto MT, we see a good example of easily distinguishable letters versus letter shapes that are the same. Arial has a little glyph on the number one to distinguish it from a lowercase l. But Callisto MT, the one and the lowercase l look almost identical. And here's the difference between a thicker font and a skinnier font. So Calibri has naturally thick lines that make up the letter. But Sego UI Lite, hence the light in the name, has very skinny lines. And there may be times to use this, but as your general, general use font in your presentation, you might not want to go this route. So let's talk about font size. In general, even when you're presenting online, aim for no smaller than 24 point for your body text. To be honest, 32 point would be better. Sometimes we can't get that. But here's the deal. No one wants to squint at your presentation. Some people in person you know, have trouble reading from far away, they have different vision conditions, or maybe their eyes are just tired. <laughs> They've been at an in-person conference for a few days looking at all these slides, and it's just getting to be a chore. Online, some people may be watching your presentation on their phone, and they don't want to have to constantly zoom in to try to read all your text. So let's look at what these font sizes look like on my screen as I'm presenting this virtually. This is my Source Sans Pro font at 32 point. And here it is at 24 point. And there's 18. If you're sitting right in front of your computer, this may be okay. But even still for me, it's a little bit small for my taste. So I use 24 point font to emphasize my points. And when I talk about this, people often go, whoa, whoa, then I can only fit a few lines of text on a slide. And that is correct. We have a tendency to overfill our slides. And 
often what we put on one slide should probably be two or three or four slides. Uh, we're putting too much information out there at one time and creating too much cognitive load for our audience. So here's some general guidelines to help with that. Aim for six or fewer objects on a slide. And if you happen to go over by one, it's not the end of the world, but that's where you start considering, should this be perhaps multiple slides? And then you can use animation or multiple slides to highlight a single line in text. So that, yes, there's a lot of information. Maybe you need to see this one point in the context of other things, but we can still direct focus to the part we're addressing right now. So here's an example. Here's a bunch of text. That's my first point. And then I still want you to keep this first point in mind, but I want to talk point by point while you can still see uh, the previous points in context. So I click next on my slides and we see the first point is kind of dithered. It's a lighter gray. And the second point now is visible. And we do the same thing for the third point and the fourth point. This could be done uh, either with animations on a single slide or you could have multiple slides. So every slide adds a line and changes the font color of previous lines to gray. And then at the end, once I'm done articulating my four points, I may do a summary, a wrap up to, to address how these four things go together. Next, let's talk about color contrast. People need to be able to read your content. Color contrast is the difference in how we perceive colors of anything, of pictures, of shapes, of text on our slides. And if they are too similar, we can't distinguish things in the foreground from the background. We need important information to stand out. The current guidelines right now uh, using WCAG standards are to make your text have a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1. So I need my text to stand out from the background so that people can read it. If you've ever attended a presentation and somebody has kind of a light gray background and a medium gray font and people start complaining, then you know why this can be so important. People stop looking at slides. Uh, conversely, if everything is high contrast, it feels like cognitive overload. And so we need to reduce the amount of color contrast to make things clearer. If we're talking about things other than text using WCAG standards, we need a contrast ratio of three to one instead of 4.5 to one. So this includes diagrams and Charts, think about your bar chart, compare the bar to what's in the background. That needs to stand out so that people can easily see it. Anything non-decorative, we're worried about color contrast. So let's take a look at how that can affect us. We'll start with some basic text, dark gray text on a white background. And here's that same dark gray text, but it's on a dark blue background. It's not as easy to read here. The, the contrast is not high enough uh, to make it so that everyone in my audience can read it. Here's light gray text on a white background. You may be able to see this up close while you're watching this recording. But again, think about people on phones, think about people in an in-person audience. That's probably not going to suffice, especially if you're in person and you have a projector that is not very clear, that, that dulls all of your colors. So here's that same font color, but with a black background. Still not very readable. That wouldn't be my first choice. I tend to go for dark text on a light background because it is very high contrast and readable.
but you can also do light text on a dark background because it also has high contrast. The highest contrast, according to the current method of calculating contrast from WCAG, is 21 to 1, and that's black text on a white background. If I chose purple, like what I'm using on a white background, that's about 9.5 to 1. So that gives you an idea of what we want to aim for. Here's blue on a gray background, and that's lower contrast. That's 2.3 to 1. So we want to get a little better contrast than that when we're choosing a color for our text. When we talk about diagrams, it's not just the text. It's every piece of it compared to the background. So we need to look at our box in this diagram and compare it to the light gray background behind it. We need to compare our text to the background in the box, so that light white text on the medium blue background. And if the arrow is important, if it's conveying information, then we need to compare the color of the arrow to the background of the slide. Let's think about charts. We definitely want to make sure our chart titles and our legends and our axis labels have a good color contrast. Then we need to make sure that, that the bars are easily distinguishable from their background. So can that blue color that I'm pointing at stand out from the light gray background where people easily see it in all the common situations in which they might view this presentation? Then I also want to make sure uh, that my bars, if I have different colors because I'm using multiple series, are different enough from each other that people can't confuse them. So there are tools that can help you with this. I tend to plan a color palette using color.mediaandme.be. Then I check my color contrast using the Color Contrast Checker app. It's actually a desktop app that you can download. And another great site is whocanuse.com. So I'll show you who can use. So here's who can use, and it's showing purple text or purple background with white text. And I can adjust this by changing the hex value of the colors or I can adjust it using the slider. But what this shows me is that it'll give me the contrast ratio according to a CAG, but it'll also help me see what it looks like for other people. So maybe I see it closer to this regular vision type, but somebody who has color vision deficiency maybe can't see all the red, so it looks much more blue. And these are various types of color vision deficiency down to achromatopia is where you see no color, which is less common. That's what we can see the percentages alongside. So when I design to be color vision deficiency friendly, I definitely make sure that I'm covering deuteranomaly and deuteranopia and protonomaly and protonopia. But in addition to color vision deficiency or color blindness, we can also see what it looks like for someone with cataracts or someone with glaucoma or just someone with low vision. We're all um, getting older and some of our prescriptions for glasses or contacts may be getting out of date. I don't want you to miss out on stuff just because of that when I could help you by my color contrast in my text. So there's lots of debate about whether dark backgrounds or light backgrounds are better. Uh, lots of developers, if you follow people on Twitter, you may see people cheering on the dark background. And I'll tell you what the latest studies I've found have said. For people with normal vision, a light background may be more effective for reading, in-depth reading. But glanceable reading, which is what we tend to do with slides, so you're not focused, 
reading a paragraph necessarily. You kind of glance up, take in the information and move on. Glanceable reading is the same during the day. Dark versus light background doesn't negatively affect it. But the light background is better in the dark. So if somebody is reading your slides at night in a dark room, it may be better to have it be a light background. Some people who have low vision may prefer a dark background, but people with astigmatism may struggle with dark mode. I actually have a slight astigmatism that's so small that my contacts can't correct it. And I do find that I prefer light backgrounds and I struggle a little more than the average person with dark backgrounds. That's not to say that I never use dark mode, but it's something to consider. So you can see here, we can't please everyone. Uh, what I take away from that is that you get to choose. You can choose dark versus light, but whatever you do, just make sure you have good color contrast from the background so your content doesn't blend in with the background of the slide. I mentioned color vision deficiency or color blindness earlier. And we need to make sure that we're not using color as the only way we're conveying information. It's not that we shouldn't use color, but in addition to color, when we're conveying information, we need to supplement that by kind of double encoding it. So yes, I can change colors based on values or what I want to emphasize, but I may also want to add symbols or additional text in a chart or patterns to help people that don't see color the same way that I do. I also want to keep my colors kind of minimal. That's not to say you can't use colors or that you can't use bright colors. It's to say that I probably don't need eight different colors on a slide. So the use of color for me is about focusing attention and highlighting important things. If everything has this bright, bold colors everywhere, we don't really know where to look on your slide. And then for color vision deficiency, we wanna avoid some problematic color combinations if possible. These color combinations, most people think about red and green, but it can also be green and brown or green and blue. Even blue and gray or blue and purple can be problematic green and gray or green and black can cause issues for people. So if you're using color to make a point where somebody needs to understand that this color is different uh, from this other color on the same slide, those are the colors that you probably don't want to put together. You saw in whocanuse.com that there are multiple types of color blindness. You may not be able to accommodate everyone. I saw someone tell a story on Twitter where they were very proud of themselves for changing their slides to just be blue and white. And that was great, but they encountered a person at one of their talks that doesn't see blue very well. Um, if you're doing kind of a monochromatic color palette, that can work because the lightness or darkness of the color is still perceptible for people with color vision deficiency. So I tend to go by what's the most common in the population that I'm presenting to and solve for those problems. That's probably the best you can do. If you can just keep it in mind that you should use something other than just color to convey information, then you should be good. I am a big fan of the Color Contrast Checker app. In general, um, for color contrast, but it will also tell me what the color looks like to people with different types of color blindness. So here's the app and I'm looking at black versus white. I'm gonna change the black to this purple color. So it has an eyedropper on it, so you can pick anything on your screens. And then it'll show me what it looks like with text versus background and tell me about contrast ratios. But there's also a color blindness simulation. 
so I can see what it looks like for someone with protonopia or someone with deuteranomaly. And this can help me decide if my colors work for most people with color vision deficiency. Another tool that I really like is color.adobe.com. It allows you to make a palette and then will tell you if any of your colors are too close to each other to be considered uh, colorblind friendly. So here's a random color palette they have as a sample. And when we see these white dashes in the colors, it means they're too close to another color. So my two blues are too similar to be easily distinguishable. But if I changed my blue a bit, that improves it. And then I have two green colors that are very similar. And so I can play with it either by moving the dots or using the sliders or typing in hex values until I get a color palette that has no dashes and that looks the colors look good together. And then I can just use that palette throughout my presentation and not have to worry about checking every little part of a graph or every text on every slide. And then once I'm done building my presentation, I may check it again with Coblis. It's the color blindness simulator from color-blindness.com. So I take a screenshot of my slide that I'm interested in checking and I upload it and it has a simulator for all the types of color blindness so I can make sure that my colors are easily distinguishable there as well. Yes, that was an origami bird that just flew away from a PowerPoint transition. We need to talk about transitions and animations. You probably don't need transitions. A lot of them are distracting. If you're going to use transitions in PowerPoint or your slide design tool of choice, just be very purposeful about it. Why are you adding a transition there? Is it because you think you need to be fancy or does it serve a purpose? Like you're ending a section and you want to convey that or is there something um, about that slide that you need to communicate this is a beginning or this is an end. The appear and disappear animations are my one exception to avoiding transitions and animations. Often we need to make things appear to add focus to that particular item while we're discussing it. And then we need it to go away or fade into the background. but we definitely never need bouncing or swirling text. It can make some people feel dizzy, but for most people, it's just distracting. So when you saw that, you were paying attention to the swirl and not to the information I'm trying to convey. So animations may be okay, but we wanna use it to focus attention not just for decoration. Let's talk about interactive materials. Many of us have polls or quizzes or other feedback mechanisms built into our presentations. And this is great because it increases audience interaction with us, but we wanna make sure those things are also accessible for people. So again, they should have good color contrast so people can read them easily. They should be keyboard and screen reader accessible. If you have a poll that you're putting out there, does it work for someone who has low vision or no vision and wants to answer your poll? They use screen reader technology like JAWS or Windows Narrator and a keyboard to get to the poll and enter their answer. We want to make sure it has legible fonts. And a big thing, not just for people with disabilities, but for people in all kinds of situations is allow enough time for interaction. If you put a poll or a quiz up, make sure your audience has time to open it in whatever browser or app they need to do so, read it, think about it, and answer the question. You might not want a lot of dead time while you're waiting on people to answer, 
So you may, you know, put up the link at the beginning or explain to people at the beginning of your presentation that you're using the software to gather feedback to share during the presentation. And so let them be prepared and be ready to answer your question to reduce some of that time or put the question up and then do something else while you're waiting on the last several people to answer. Let's talk attendee handouts. In the Microsoft Data Platform community, we tend to get asked to leave our slides. Please put a PDF copy you know, on the conference website, or we put it on our websites, our personal blogs or websites. But when you do that, you need to check a few things. If you have lots of images, you need to add alt text for your images so that someone who uses a screen reader gets the information that the image was used to convey. If it's decorative, it doesn't really have a lot of meaning. It's okay, you still should hide it from screen readers um, or explain it in the alt text. There's also a concept called reading order and that's which objects on your slide does a person who's just navigating with a keyboard arrive upon first. So if we look at my slide, I probably would hide the attendee handouts icon on the left. I would let them read the section heading of attendee handouts, but I probably want them to read is your slide file accessible first. So that would be the first thing in my reading order. PowerPoint has a built-in accessibility checker that can help you with a lot of this. It will point out when you've missed alt text, when your reading order needs to be checked. So go ahead and turn that on while you're working and it can help catch things so that you don't have to go back and then fix all the slides. Whereas if you'd known ahead of time, maybe you could fix your slide design process to include that, making it easier. If you're converting your slides to PDF instead of using a PowerPoint format or a Google Slides format, make sure your PDF is accessible. There are actually different versions of PDFs and some PDFs are not naturally accessible. Some of them, for instance, they'll treat everything as an image. Others let you read text from them. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes leaving your slides is not the answer. It's a lazy answer, but with a lot of my presentations, the slides don't stand alone. The slides don't really, they represent the topics that I talk about, but they don't include every single takeaway. So sometimes an extra document is better. This can be just a simple Word document that you design for attendees. So when they go to get your slides afterwards, they go and get this document as well. The nice thing about Word documents is you can use headings and alt text there too, so that you can make sure this document is accessible for keyboard users and screen reader users. There is a built-in accessibility checker in Word that you can use to help you make sure your handout is accessible. And then make sure, if you can, to make that handout available to your audience before the session. So when I started this presentation, I said I have slides and handouts on my website at datasavvy.me on the presentations tab, and people can feel free to go and get them. So for those who like to take notes, they can start from my handout so they don't have to copy down the URLs I'm speaking about. Uh, they can focus more on listening to me or watching a demo so that they don't have to uh, try to do two things at once. All the URLs from my presentation, as well as highlights of important points, are in my handout. That lets someone relax and enjoy your presentation a little more. So we've covered the slide design, but we also need to talk about how we speak to our audience. We want to respect our audience. And for me, that means four things. 
understanding their existing knowledge. How much previous experience or knowledge do they have on the topic that I'm speaking about? Avoiding or explaining jargons, acronyms, technical terms to make sure everyone in the room knows what I'm talking about. Using inclusive language. And then structuring my presentation so that I present with purpose. So let's talk about understanding our audience's existing knowledge. We don't want to talk way above or way below our audience's level of knowledge. If you can, ask beforehand about the audience profile and expertise. So if you're presenting on Power BI, if it's a conference, ask the organizers who they expect to attend. Is this for brand new uh, people who have never opened Power BI desktop? Or is this people who are more advanced and are looking to master DAX? You may talk to them and point out different things because of their level of knowledge and understanding. We can't always try to get that before we speak. So if you are on a live presentation, you can ask the audience and try to adjust your explanations as best you can to meet them where they're at. Let's talk jargon and acronyms. Do you know what all of these acronyms are? RDBMS, SSDT, ACID, NUMA, CCI, DML, OLTP, RBAR, and DAC. If I threw all of these at you, would you be sure that you know exactly what I'm talking about? So here's how I'm using those acronyms. RGBMS is a relational database management system. RBAR is row by agonizing row. Especially things like RBAR, which is kind of a technical jargon thing, but is not common to everybody's terminology we need to explain what we're saying. So it's not that we cannot ever use acronyms or jargon, but we can write it out or explain the terminology the first time we mention it, and then we can move on and reference the, the shortened name or the jargon now that we are sure that our audience knows what we're talking about. The worst thing that you could do is make someone feel unwelcome in your presentation. Different people will take away different things from your presentation, but you'll definitely turn some audience members off if you're using language that makes it seem like they are not welcome. So some easy things that you can do is change your greeting. Instead of saying, hey guys, Hi folks, or hello everyone, depending on how formal you're trying to be, can be an easy substitution. Another thing that lots of technical presentations do is the speaker will say, oh, it's easy to do this, or it's obvious that this is what's going on. Well, it may not be obvious for everybody in the audience, and now that person for whom it wasn't obvious is thinking, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe this is too advanced for me. So if you're doing a demo, instead of saying, oh, it's easy, you just click here, you can just skip that first part and say, click on this menu item. Or instead of saying it's obvious that, say, notice that and then point it out. If it's important enough to point out, then we should highlight it and not shame people for not having noticed that before you point it out. We also want to avoid terms like ADD or OCD or bipolar uh, being used as a metaphor. This could be, you know, there's, if I were speaking about really messy slides and things were not properly aligned, Someone might say, oh, that bothers my OCD. But OCD is a real condition that many people struggle with. It's not the same as liking things to be neat. Same thing with bipolar. I've seen people show graphs where a metric bounces up and down constantly and they go, yeah, this, you know, this server, this metric is, is bipolar. Well, bipolar is a serious condition 
um, we don't want to make light of people's struggles. So we can avoid that and just say, look how the chart uh, varies and oscillates going up and down. And then we want to check our privilege. We want to avoid terms that might be ableist or racist or sexist or homophobic. This can vary from culture to culture, but here's the deal. If you wanted that person who is gay in your audience to learn, you probably don't want to distract them with gay slurs. Aside from the uh, moral imperative to treat other people well and not discriminate against them, if your goal in your presentation is to teach people something or to have them come away from your presentation with good memories of you, using terms that can offend people will lessen your chances of doing that. So the last thing is just to structure and present your presentation with purpose. This means you don't ramble, that you've thought about the order of your slides and if they make sense in taking people on a journey to learn what you want them to learn. It's okay to ad lib during a presentation, but make sure you're managing your time well. Make sure that your stories or ad libs have a point that reinforces your presentation content. We want to respect people's time and their focus, their attention, by presenting in a way that is enjoyable and easily consumable. So to recap what we've talked about in this presentation, inclusive design affects both usability and accessibility. If we design inclusively, it's more than just fixing things for people with diagnosed disabilities. It can make things better for every person in your audience. If you can, even if you can't control it, ask about your presentation environment before you present. That way you can figure out captions or uh, colors that may need to be adjusted. Use legible large fonts. That's one of the best things you can do. Make sure the text in your slide is easily readable whether it's projected onto a really large wall or whether someone's looking at it on their laptop or whether they're looking at it on their phone. And then plan and check your color contrast. Make sure your text or your charts stand out from the background. If you're going to do handouts, whether that's a copy of your slides or an additional document, make sure those handouts are accessible. And then respect your audience's experiences, whether that is their level of technical knowledge, their uh, health conditions, or their experiences as a minority. Make them feel just as included in your presentation as anyone else in the room or in the audience. So I hope you'll go forward as a speaker, making your presentations more inclusive you can always contact me uh, on my website, datasavvy.me, or on Twitter at mmarie if you have questions. Thanks so much for watching.